Okay, this has been a great time. Uh, I want to really thank our host, Renee Khan, and all the people at Mount Sinai that helped put this together. And uh, it was a wonderful night last night, and great food and great company today. And I can't believe we've gone three years and not had a meeting together like this. So this is a nice celebration. And we're going to start now with um, our senior speakers. And our first speaker is Professor Philip McGuire, and he is Professor of Psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Oxford. Uh, he's, um, he leads the Precision Psychiatry and Bioresource Teams in NIHR Oxford Health Biomedical uh, Research Center. He's also Associate Director for Research and Development in the Oxford Health NIHS Foundation Trust, as well as Director of the Open Early Detection Service and the Principal Investigator at the Wellcome Center for Integrated, uh, Integrated Neuroimaging. And he is going to talk today about CBD as a novel treatment for psychosis. Thanks very much. Uh, welcome back. I hope you've had a refreshing lunch. Um, so my name is Philip McGuire. First of all, I want to thank Rennie and Scott Woods for inviting me to this fantastic event. It's a real pleasure to be here in this fantastic city and, and uh, interact with everyone face to face. So my remit today is to talk a little bit about um, uh, one of the novel candidate um, treatments for clinical high risk, which is uh, CBD or cannabidiol. So I'm going to give you a, a a little summary of why we think this might be a useful treatment. So first of all, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the kind of unmet clinical need in the clinical high-risk population, then give you a bit of background on cannabidiol, some preclinical studies and some early phase clinical trials, and then talk about the, the new trial that we're going to be starting shortly, which is called PROMOTE. So, um, there's been absolutely fantastic advances in our understanding of at-risk mental states or ultra-high-risk states or whatever you want to call it over the last 20 years, but it hasn't yet led to an approved treatment. So at the moment, if one runs a clinical service for this population, um, we can offer non-specific um, support, not really any proven uh, licensed effective treatments. Um, so we really need something to offer both for the, the symptoms of the high-risk state and also in the longer term for possible prevention of transition. Um, and the other um, aspect to treatment in this population is that if we do identify a compound or an intervention that is effective, uh, an important consideration is its acceptability and tolerance, particularly if you've got a relatively healthy population in which you're trying to prevent something and this might involve treatment over a long period it's very important that whatever you offer is a benign acceptable treatment and um, one of the appeals of cannabidiol is it seems to to tick those boxes so um when you speak to the general public about um using a cannabinoid to treat um, psychosis um it's often met with incredulity because um, there's a, a, a widespread awareness of the role, the possible role of cannabis use in making psychosis worse or even causing psychosis. So um, one has to deal with some quite confusing um, aspects to cannabinoids. And the first is that the cannabis plant contains a number of different compounds and the two most um, abundant are THC, and CBD. And um, these have quite different properties. So um, there's been lots of evidence in, in the scientific literature and in the media about the possibility that cannabis use might exacerbate psychosis or even cause psychosis. So the first hurdle is to explain to people that we're not talking about giving people cannabis, but um, pure cannabidiol extracted from the cannabis plant. And um, one of the first clues that these different constituents of the plant might have quite different effects came from observational studies of 
cannabis users. So these are not people with psychosis, just the general population. And uh, what one can observe is that the higher the THC content of cannabis and the lower the CBD content, the more psychotogenic it is. And unfortunately, these days, the, the illicit cannabis market is mainly dominated by brands of cannabis that have lots of THC and almost no CBD. So um, these strains of cannabis plant are more likely to cause um, psychotic symptoms or transient psychotic symptoms. And the other confusion is about cannabidiol specifically. So um, there is over-the-counter or internet cannabidiol, which is freely available all over the place on the high street. And then there's pharmaceutical grade cannabidiol. And these are quite different. Um, first of all, one is pure, a uh, pure molecule, which is the pharmaceutical CBD. So this is CBD where all the other cannabinoids have been um, uh, carefully extracted, leaving just pure CBD. And these over-the-counter products, which may contain various other cannabinoids in addition to CBD. And then the other big difference is dose. So that pharmaceutical grade CBD is generally speaking much, has a much higher uh, dose of CBD in it compared to the over-the-counter um, formulations. And all the research I'm gonna be talking about going forward in, in this presentation just refers to the pharmaceutical grade pure CBD and not these over-the-counter things, which, which actually haven't been researched really at all. So um, one of the first um, studies that, that we did using um, cannabinoids was to take pure CBD and pure THC as separate molecules and administer them in single doses to healthy volunteers and look at the effects on symptoms. So in this model, um, healthy volunteers would be studied on three different occasions with either CBD, placebo, or THC, and they would just measure the symptomatic effects. What this showed was that the Whereas THC very reliably can produce transient positive psychotic symptoms like paranoia, um, cannabidiol doesn't do this at all. In fact, it's, it's in, indistinguishable from placebo. So cannabidiol does not cause psychotic symptoms. That was the first finding here. And the second finding from these kind of experiments was that if you pre-treat a healthy individual with cannabidiol and then expose them to THC, it can block the psychotogenic effect of the THC. So this was the first kind of experimental medicine evidence in humans that CBD might have an antipsychotic type effect because it's blocking the psychotic effects of THC. And um, we repeated these kind of experiments with the subject inside the scanner so we could measure the um, pharmacological effect of an acute dose of either CBD or THC on brain function while the individual was in the scanner. And we did this across a variety of paradigms. And the striking finding was that independent of the paradigm, the same pattern of differences emerged in that whichever region of the brain we were looking at with whichever paradigm, CBD tended to have the opposite effect to THC on brain function. So if THC caused activation, CBD would cause deactivation and vice versa. So this led to the kind of simplistic notion that that kind of um, uh, regional activity level, these compounds seem to be having opposite effects. So again, CBD and, and THC at both behavioral and um, biological levels seem to be very different compounds. And independent of this research, um, there's been work using PET to look at the potential targets of CBD in the brain. And one can image the cannabinoid system using specific ligands for particular receptors. So one of the receptors is the CB1 receptor, and you can, you can make a ligand that will bind to that receptor and, and look at the distribution in the brain. And this has been done um, in com comparing patients with schizophrenia and controls and showing that the, there is a significant difference in the availability of these cannabinoid receptors in psychosis. So this endocannabinoid system seems to be altered somehow in people with a psychotic disorder. Okay, so what about 
using CBD as a treatment. So the, the first studies to do this were uh, done in Brazil by Antonio Zuardi, who started um, giving it to his patients who had not done very well with antipsychotic medications. So in a series of case reports, he, he described giving patients CBD and finding that in some cases it seemed to be effective when antipsychotic medications were, were not. So in terms of reducing their psychotic symptoms. And then the first trial was done by Marcus Lueke in, in Germany, where he did a kind of head-to-head -head comparison of an antipsychotic medication, which is amisulpride, and compared that in a kind of non-inferiority trial with CBD. And the finding was that both compounds seem to reduce psychotic symptoms in patients to a similar extent. And then the first placebo controlled trial um, was done um, in 2018, where we worked with GW to study um, CBD as an adjunct to antipsychotic medication in people with psychosis. And um, the main finding from that study was that adding CBD to existing treatment in patients with psychosis seemed to produce an additional benefit in terms of the, the PAN score and the CGI. So an improve an overall clinical improvement and a reduction in positive symptoms. Um, and we've done some studies, experimental um, type studies with CBD in people with clinical high risk for psychosis. Um, so in this study, we've given a single dose of CBD and placebo on separate occasions to people at high risk and looked at the modulatory effect of CBD on brain function uh, across a couple of different tasks. And in both cases, um, the, the main effects were evident in two regions, the, the medial temporal or hippocampal region and the striatum. So, I mean, the, the reason this is interesting is that the, the hippocampus and the striatum, as far as we know, seem to be particularly important in the transition to psychosis in people at high risk. So this suggests that CBD seems to be having some kind of biological action in the regions that are relevant to this process. So you can you can kind of see this from this um, this diagram. So um, in our group, we've done a lot of neuroimaging studies where we've compared um, structural function neurochemical data in people who transition to psychosis and people who don't. And the the, the summary of all that work really is that a circuit involving the hippocampus and the striatum seems to be critical to transition so that the, the function of these areas and the interactions between them seems to be different in people who transition to psychosis from those who don't. So the fact that CBD is targeting these two regions, hippocampus and the striatum, is, is consistent with the idea that it might be useful in the clinical high risk group. And just going back to the, the side effect issue, I mean, um, com in comparison to say antipsychotic medications, one of the great things about cannabidiol is it has very few side effects. So a very benign profile. Really the only side effect that sometimes occur is some GI disturbance, but really other than that, very little in side effects. And um, if you ask patients with psychosis about whether they'd be interested in having cannabidiol, um, the overwhelming response, I think 86% 80, of respondents in, in this survey said that they would really like to have CBD instead of their antipsychotic medication. So it's got a, a very, very high acceptability um, among patients. And this is, in, this is the polar opposite to antipsychotic medications, which are themselves associated with stigma, which puts patients off from taking them. So this is a big advantage on top of any effectiveness. Um, that there might be. So um, for, for all those reasons, we, we think that um, cannabidiol is quite a promising novel candidate um, intervention in people at clinical high risk. And we're going to study this in um, a program of three clinical trials involving cannabidiol, um, one in, in clinical high risk individuals, one in first episode patients, and one in people with treatment resistance. And this is funded by the, the Wellcome Trust. So the, the, the clinical high-risk trial, um, which I'll focus on today, is, is called PROMOTE. And it involves um, mainly sites in Europe and in uh, North America. And um, some of these sites um, overlap 
with the AMP Schizophrenia Network. Um, we were just about to apply for the ethical approval for this, uh, so we're hoping to start that once we have the um, approval. And um, because um, cannabidiol is a cannabidiol is a licensed medicine for epilepsy in children, um, there is a lot of safety data already about this. So we're hoping that that will be um, helpful when we come to apply for approval. So right. So, um, so the primary aim of the PROMOTE study is just to test at, at, at scale whether cannabidiol is effective and safe in people at clinical high risk. And we're also interested as a sort of secondary measure in trying to understand a bit more about the mechanism of action of, of CBD in this particular group. So, um, so this is a, a cartoon just summarizing the design. So the, the key to the design is it's, it's an adjunctive um, placebo controlled use of CBD. So um, different clinical centers for early detection, clinical high risk clients get a variety of different clinical packages. The idea is that whatever the treatment as usual is in a given site, um, people would get that plus or minus CBD or placebo. And then we're going to um, offer treatment for up to two years. The rationale being that the, the risk window for transition is maximal over the first two years from presentation. And then we look at two outcomes that the, the, we're going to measure the effect of the presenting on the presenting symptoms at about four weeks, and then look at longer term outcomes like transition over a two year for what period. Um, the, the participants are typical, exactly the same type of people that would take part in um, Pronet. Um, the main difference to Pronet is that we're, we're a little bit more liberal with um, antipsychotic history and with cannabis use. So um, antipsychotic exposure is not an exclusion criteria unless it's, it's, a, it's at a kind of um, first episode dose level and has been fairly recent. And we're allowing cannabis use, um, even though we're giving a cannabinoid as our intervention, we, we felt that pragmatically um, cannabis use is pretty prevalent in this population. Um, rather than exclude anyone who uses cannabis, we're going to very carefully monitor and, uh, and measure THC and CBD in the blood um, in the participants and, and co-vary for that as necessary. Um, so the, the other piece about this was just um, understanding how CBD might work. So um, CBD has a number of highly plausible molecular mechanisms of action, which may or may not account for its effects in psychosis. And the problem is we don't know which of these um, is relevant to psychosis. So one of the, the aims of the study is to try and capitalize on the biggest ever exposure to CBD in psychosis and, and use the trial as a vehicle to study the, the mechanism of action. So the way we plan to do that is, oh dear, sorry, it's the jet lag. Um, the way we plan to do this is to uh, study um, MR imaging, PET imaging, uh, collect CSF and, and blood before and after four weeks of treatment in all the trial participants. So this will allow us to test how CBD is acting on the brain and also look at whether there's a difference in people who respond to treatment and people who don't. So to give you a, a, an example of how that might work, um, we've got a couple of sites where they have availability of PET ligands for two of the plausible um, brain targets for CBD. One is the CB1 receptor that I mentioned earlier, and the other is FAA, which is the enzyme that um, CBD inhibits this enzyme and, and can thereby alter endocannabinoid levels in the brain. So in two separate studies, we'll be able to um, measure the availability of these putative targets before and after um, treatment and then relate that to treatment response. So um, the, the sort of big picture on this um, from a kind of treatment of psychosis point of view is that um, there haven't really been any 
new classes of treatment for psychosis since the 1950s when chlorpromazine was introduced. Um, so it would be a big deal for our field if we could identify um, a treatment that acted in a different way than D2 antagonism. And um, we don't know exactly how CBD works, but it's definitely not through C uh, D2 antagonism. So if it does work and we can understand the mechanism, we could potentially identify um, a new type of therapeutic target, and that might open the door to the development of other compounds and also the possibility of um, improving symptoms of psychosis that are not responsive to standard antipsychotic treatment. Um, so we're hoping that, um, well, there's a reasonable chance, I think, that CBD might be um, one of these, uh, so might be such a component. Okay, so I um, want to thank you very much for, for listening and also thank all my colleagues who've um, contributed to all this work. Thanks very much. We have five minutes for questions. Okay. Okay. Yes, sure. Yeah. So, so the question uh, I was asked to repeat your yeah. question. The question is, um, is it a, a standalone treatment or adjunctive? And the answer is it's adjunctive. So we, we elected to use it as an adjunctive treatment. And the rationale was, um, in order to, um, we didn't want clinicians worrying that they would be denying their clients standard care. So everyone gets standard care and then they either get to see more CBD. So you're not missing out on anything if you take part in the trial. That was the rationale. No, it's just treatments as usual. So it's a very pragmatic approach. Well, this is a really fascinating work that you're doing again, and starting off our next question is Is there, do you or do you know that you just to have uh, an intent or a, a goal to someday try CBD as an alternative to antipsychotics? Yeah. And maybe at least two modules you can get studies like growth and speed? Yes. So, yeah, so the question is uh, what about CBD as a monotherapy? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, and in fact, I mean, um, Marcus Luica did use it as a monotherapy and he did this small trial where he did a uh, head to head against amisulfite and found that it was non inferior to, um, it had the same effect as amisulfite. So there is already evidence for that. I mean, um, um, not so much in the high risk trial, but in, in the first episode trials, we, we didn't want to, we thought it would be difficult at this stage to persuade clinicians to stop, to take people off an antipsychotic and put them on some novel compound that, that is relatively unproven. So that's why we went for a jump to the first. But I agree, I mean, there's, it's, it would be very interesting. I mean, if, it, if it's targeting a different system, then it's logical to use it as a, as a monotherapy rather than, well, you, you, could, you could make the case that a monotherapy would work. And, in terms of the um, acceptability, um, if you ask the patients, they would like to have it instead of, rather than as an adjunct. Well, I that's my that, that question. Um, and then, um, is there, uh, the data in the New York shows that the side effects are very small, I mean, but it's so that, um, there's a data on the uh, diversity of different like, types of, and looking at that, it would be used in cutting out of the 
Um, yeah, it, yes. So the question is, are, are there any data on subtypes of psychosis that might be more or less responsive to CBD? The answer to is a really interesting question. The, the, the studies that have been done so, so far have all been quite small, small samples, and so it hasn't, they haven't been large enough to do that really. So we, we don't know as yet, but I mean, this sample size potentially could be big enough to address that as a sort of secondary question. Is there one more question coming? Yes. Are they so convincing um, in the original scenes that feature uh, are they really obviously THC and tendencies of the vaping and the pulsars? But I think even the new growth are fairly well, so they didn't harm more natural focus on encouraging and being able to really be for our using the trade, but there's anything built in the usual or the loose scenes of swap vaping with some I'll try and repeat that. Um, so I think you're asking, are we going to try and intervene to deal with the concurrent substance use in the participants? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Um, to be honest, we, we haven't thought of that. Um, so the answer is no. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's an interesting question. Um, and I guess the primary, we, we just really want to see in a, in a, in a, in a kind of un, untouched population what the impact of the interventions. Is there, is there some 